Welcome to the Renaissance and welcome to Education and the Negro Path 1. And to you, our dear viewer, it is never our intention to offend you or anyone with our videos. It is not also our intention to suggest, insinuate or preach hate towards any group, race, tribe or person. There is also no propaganda or any deliberate attempt to misinform anyone with our videos. The goal is for you to look for the books, journals, magazines or other publications referenced and study them yourself. Remember, education must not simply teach work, it must teach life. W.E.B. DeBoer And from Katha G. Woodson, the so-called modern education with all its defects, however, does others so much more good than it does the Negro because it has been worked out in conformity to the needs of those who have enslaved and oppressed weaker peoples, Katha G. Woodson. And have you ever tried to understand what Malcolm X is saying where he said only a fool would let his enemy teach his children? So please remember to separate the individual from the system and that education is not limited to the classroom. It includes movies, music, news, sports, religion. And if you are taught the wrong thing in school or anywhere else, it is still education, only that you have been fed with the wrong information or the wrong education. But whichever way, it is still education. And today we shall examine the case of a queer null order. The slave master recorded that a queer null order's place of birth was controversial. Let us examine the case of a queer null order or Gustavus Vasa by looking at his own side of the story. Remember, the slave master had his own side, Equiano had his own side, and we do a basic balance of probabilities to show that the slave master is a liar. But one question we must seek to answer is, what is the slave master's interest in leaving the content of his narrative and facing the fact of where he was born? And before we move into that, let us quickly reference The Miseducation of the Negro by Carter Godwin Woodson and it was published in 1933 and there we see the following that the difficulty is that the educated Negro is compelled to live and move among his own people whom he has been taught to despise. As a rule, therefore, the educated Negro prefers to buy his food from a white grocer because he has been taught that the Negro is not clean. It does not matter how often a Negro washes his hands, then he cannot clean them. And it does not matter how often a white man uses his hands, he cannot soil them. The educated Negro, moreover, is disinclined to take part in Negro business because he has been taught in economics that Negroes cannot operate in this particular sphere. The educated Negro gets less and less pleasure out of the Negro church, not on account of its primitiveness and increasing corruption, but because of his preference for the seats of righteousness controlled by his oppressor. This has been his education and nothing else can be expected of him. So you can pause the video and read the entire thing yourself. But our interest is for you to see how Negro education works. So here we see something very close to the Hebrew Israelite doctrine of how it was this, the almighty creator of heaven and earth that ordained them for slavery based on an account and a story written by the slave masters. So here it tells us that the oppressor has the right to exploit, to handicap and to kill the oppressed. Negroes daily educated in the tenets of such a religion of the strong have accepted the status of the weak as divinely ordained and during the last three generations of the anominal freedom they have done practically nothing to change it. So you see the thing they are talking about today, it was the same story then and we have records of where they wrote it themselves at that time that they were being punished for the same reason you hear the Hebrew Israelites claim today. Meanwhile, we have to remind you that the Most High did not write any book. It is never written anywhere that the Most High wrote any book. 
And even if you want to believe the Most High could have written any book, there is no way the Most High could have written the book about a group in a language they did not understand, in a way that they were not even allowed to read it at that time. But let us just move forward. And here we see that the educated Negroes have the attitude of contempt towards their own people because in their own as well as in their mixed schools, Negroes are taught to admire the Hebrew, the Greek, the Latin, the Teuton and to despise the African. Of the hundreds of Negro high schools recently examined by an expert in the United States Bureau of Education, only 18 offer a course taking up the history of the Negro and in most of the Negro colleges and universities where the Negro is taught of, the race is studied only as a problem or dismissed as of little consequence. For example, an officer of a Negro university thinking that an additional course on the Negro should be given there called upon a Negro doctor of philosophy of the faculty to offer such work. He promptly informed the officer that he knew nothing about the Negro. He did not go to school to waste his time that way. So you see the problems we have today. They have always been there. So when you hear the so-called African Americans and the likes of the Callaway or Professor Gates claiming one thing or the other, they have been paid to propagate. You should know that it has always been there. So if you reduce your ability to think, it's entirely up to you. But if you can take time, study the materials, look at how your ancestors were oppressed, it will give you a chance to emancipate yourself from the yoke of mental slavery. Let us also reference the education of the Negro prior to 1861, a history of the education of the colored people of the United States from the beginning of slavery to the Civil War by C.G. Woodson, Ph.D., Harvard, published 1915, and there we see the following that it was this class of slaveholders that finally won the majority of southerners to their way of thinking and determined that negroes should be educated now remember it was forbidden to educate the negro at that time meanwhile some people believe that a book written in a language they never knew source they don't know could have been them and written by the almighty creator of heaven and earth which we know is impossible not just being a lie but it's impossible so now we go further we see where it says the history of the education of the antebellum negroes therefore falls into two periods the first extends from the time of the introduction of slavery to the climax of the insurrectionary movement about 1835 when the majority of the people in this country answered in the affirmative the question whether or not it was prudent to educate the, their slaves. Then followed the second period when the industrial revolution changed slavery from a patriarchal to an economic institution and when intelligent Negroes encouraged by abolitionists made so many attempts to organize several insurrections that the pendulum began to swing the other way. So you see what we're talking about. And further, we see where it says later, when measures were passed to prohibit the education of slaves, some masters, always a law unto themselves, continued to teach their Negroes in defiance of the hostile legislation. Sympathetic persons were not able to accomplish much because they were usually reformers who not only did not own slaves but dwelt in practically free settlements far from the plantations on which the bondmen lived. So you see the situation at that time. So here again we see put to shame by this noble example of the Catholics, the English colonists had to find a way to overcome the objections of those who granted that the enlightenment of the slaves might not lead to several insurrection, nevertheless feared that their conversion might work manumission. So you see how it was and how difficult it was at that time. Their interest in educating the Negroes were actually to convert them to their religion. So you see how encompassing the education is and that should give you an idea of why the Negroes are the way they are today. And that should also give you the idea why they want to obliterate the Negro identity. That's why you see them calling African African and using the likes of um, Professor Gates or 
then Callaway to look for a way to make sure that they water down that identity and then of course over time the entire race will disappear as if they never existed. Here we see that many of these connections justified slavery as established by the president of the Hebrews but they felt that persons held to service should be instructed as were the servants of the household of Abraham. The progress of the scores was impeded, however, by the bigoted class of Puritans who did not think well of the policy of incorporating undesirable persons into the church so closely connected then with the state. The first settlers of the American colonies to offer Negroes the same educational and religious privileges they provided for persons of their own race were the Quakers. Believing in the brotherhood of man and the fatherhood of God, they taught the colored people to read their own instruction in the book of the law that they might be wise unto salvation. So now you see the difference. That book, that same book, that the Negroes should walk as hard as possible and find out the source of it is the key to all these things. Everything they do, they find justification in that book. Everything. And going further, you see where it says, with all these new opportunities, Negroes exhibited a rapid mental development. Intelligent colored men proved to be useful and trustworthy servants. They became much better laborers and artisans, and many of them showed administrative ability adequate to the management of business establishments and large plantations. Moreover, better rudimentary education served many ambitious persons of color as a stepping stone to higher attainment. Negroes learned to appreciate and write poetry and contributed something to mathematics, science, and philosophy. Furthermore, having disproved the theories of their mental inferiority, some of the race, in conformity with the suggestion of cotton matter, were employed to teach white children. So you see the thing. These are from people that were classified as animals to people who were now excelling in different places. Now remember, do not ever believe that the slave master introduced the Negroes to learning. It's not true because if you looked at earlier records, it showed that the Negroes had their own way of learning. They had virtually everything. And remember, the Negroes in America were slaves, captured, raided, and hunted by non-Negroes in Africa at that time. So you understand what the whole game is all about. So here again, it tells us that the first real educators to take up the work of enlightening American Negroes were clergymen interested in the propagation of the gospel among the heathen of the new world. Addressing themselves to this task, the missionaries easily discovered that their first duty was to educate these crude elements to enable them not only to read the truth for themselves but to appreciate the supremacy of the Christian religion. Now remember this was the same thing they did in Sub-Saharan Africa where they came and freed them from the Mohammedans who were the captors because what happened with the slave trade was it was the Mohammedans capturing the Negroes and selling to the Christians and the other Mohammedans. Now you notice how it said here to enable them read the truth themselves. But if you check all Christian doctrines and all Mohammedan doctrines, there is none that is coming from the Negroes. It's still coming from the owners of the religions. That should tell you exactly what the game is. Now that we have some background of what education can be or cannot be, let us reference the interesting narrative of the life of Olo de Quiano, or Gustavus Vasa, the African, written by himself and this is the ninth edition and it was published in 1794 and there we see the following that an invidious falsehood having appeared in the oracle of the 25th and the star of the 27th of april 1792 with a view to hurt my character and to discredit and prevent the sale of my narrative asserting that I was born in the Danish island of Santa Cruz in the West Indies. It is necessary that in this edition I should take notice thereof and it is only needful for me to appeal to those 
numerous and respectable persons of character who knew me when I first arrived in England and could speak no language but that of Africa. Under this appeal, I now offer this edition of my narrative to the candid reader and to the friends of humanity, hoping it may still be the means in its measure of showing the enormous cruelties practiced on my feeble brethren and strengthening the generous emulation now prevailing in this country to put a speedy end to a traffic both cruel and unjust. Edinburgh, June 1792. So please remember that Equiano was not the first Negro to write a book. Kuguano Otoba was actually one of the first. We are not sure what happened before then. Now remember, there is nothing about the Negroes written by themselves before 1760s or 1770s. You have to bear this in mind. So when you want to tell us about Adam and Eve, remember to tell us what and where the Negroes were before 1434 when the slave trade started. We need that information and we will ultimately explain to you why we need it. So now let us quickly look at how the slave master is very subtle. Remember, they didn't like Equiano's book. So let us reference Equiano's travels, his autobiography, the interesting narrative of the life followed Equiano, abridged and edited by Paul Edwards. This was in 1967s. Now remember, this is someone, a slave master or an European, trying to reproduce what Equiano was saying. But then, there lies the subtle way the slave master uses to demonize the Negro. Remember, the Negro goes to school from beginning to end, learning that he is inferior. Whether you want to believe it or not is a different thing. We shall ultimately show you. He learns nothing about his race, nothing at all. Whether in South Saharan Africa, in Europe, in Asia, in the whole world over, that's what the Negro goes to school to learn. He learns nothing about himself. So here, the author tells us that it was published in 1789, but it is not the first work written by an African in English. The poems of Phyllis Whitley appeared in 1773, Ignatius Sanchez collected letters in 1782, and Otto Bakugano's thoughts and sentiments on the evil and wicked traffic of slavery in 1787. But Equiano's book is of more lasting interest than any of these. Now remember, because Equiano's book touched on something that contradicted the slave master's message and demonization of Africa, that's why it became a sticking and a stall point. That's why they were determined to make sure that they debunk it as much as they can. Then you notice that the less intelligent Negroid and Hamitic groups in Africa join them to make sure that there is nothing like Equiano or his narrative if he can be made a lie. If you doubt what we are saying, if you wake up and try to suggest to any African that these people were like this or you know the Hebrew Israelites claiming they were the chosen people, if you make or put up such a claim, you will notice that all the other African groups will rise against you. But if you say you and them are chosen, they agree with it. But the moment you say, oh no, this is the only group, they now become, of course, they start fighting you. But then, another interesting thing is that even though they are the ones fighting you, they forget that when they say you are one with them, they are still the same ones used by the slave masters to mother you. They mother people with the weapons provided this with by the slave masters the same way they captured and sold them to the slave masters. So you see the essence of all their we, 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 or we are all Africans. So you understand it. So our interest is what this author is saying. Now remember, this is about education. Now a child goes to school. Equiano wrote his book, his narrative said the truth the best way he saw it but the slave master looks for every way to rubbish his work to make it look like a lie so quickly notice here that this author is saying these writers are not likely to interest the modern reader except as curiosities 
The third writer, Kugoana, says little in his book about himself, and most of its pages are devoted to the denunciation of the slave trade, so that, again, its interest is for the historian or sociologist rather than the general public. In fact, it seems likely either that Kugoano did not write thoughts and sentiments or that it was largely revised for him. Now, if you notice, he, they are trying to suggest that the negroes are not that intelligent enough to have written nice pieces now if you notice again he is saying that the book d doesn't make sense but the slave trade was going on at that time and these are people that are victims of it fighting to see how to get it to end but you see how this european has picked up the books and has tried to water everything that had happened down and try to say oh no they are not history or they are not of interest and all that now if you don't pay very close attention to details you won't understand what they are trying to achieve one of the questions you should be able to start asking yourself is why did they jump out from nowhere to now allege that Equiano was not born in Africa that's one question you should ask because of the book that's the only reason but then there is something they wanted to achieve because they wanted to always look like the negro is not sensible enough to write a book of that nature at that time that's why they rose up and above all what he wrote conflicts with what they wanted people to believe about africa at the same time too so you see the author here also goes on to say it has been suggested that Equiano's autobiography too might have been improved by another hand and there is some evidence for revision since there appear to be two quite distinct styles in the book, the one plain, the other rhetorical. This question will be discussed later, but though there is always the possibility that the rhetorical passages may be revisions by another hand, the main part of the book is certainly Equiano's own, and in any case, it is not the passages of the highest literary pretension which best display Equiano's narrative skill. So again, you see the, the game, they was to look for a way to bring it down. You see, remember if you wrote a book today, you were going to look for proofreaders. You were going to look for people to help you do it. But you see how they are turning, even if that happened, you see how they are turning it around to mean something else. It's just like trying to say he couldn't have written it himself. Now, they didn't leave it at that. They even went further to now question his place of birth. If they had a way, they would have also said he, he wasn't the one that wrote it so you understand the picture now a child that goes to school is already being told that there is nothing good about his race his race has never achieved anything positive and cannot even where they did it has to they have to look for a way to look for how it could have been done and you can pause this video and read this page yourself it gives an account of the falsehood published by two newspapers now notice that the slave master just came up with a story the editor apologized never said where he got it from which is the same thing they still do today which we can show you some of the ways they have done it today if you want to understand it follow the bbc and the british media you will see how they play the same game till today exactly by looking at places like ambazonia and biafra that is where you see their key propaganda techniques coming to life we shall ultimately get to a point where we will be picking up BBC stories, their documentaries, and debunk them. That's the best to, the little way we can, knowing that they are lies. It's easier when you know the truth to debunk any lie, so that you people will understand it for what they are. They are designed to continue to demonize the Negro. Remember, if you doubt what we're saying, the British rules Nigeria through the Fulanese. This is documented, which we can show you if you have not seen it already in the Tropical Dependency by Flora Show. So now, what they do is, because they are ruling through them, one of the things they do is miseducation and misinformation. The curriculum is drawn by them. Everything is drawn by them because the Hamitic groups and the Negroid groups are not very intelligent. They don't have any understanding of what development is all about. So all the slave master needed to do is to hide behind them and be throwing the punches. So while you are looking at them as the culprits, the slave master is the one behind them, solidly, providing them with both the propaganda and the weapons with which they cause their damage. So but let us just move forward, at least now that we have an idea of how they change the narratives of anything. You see that this author is trying to tell us that the book 
wasn't written by Equiano and Otoba couldn't have written his own either. So you see the two books that are very popularly known as one of the best works of Negroes are being dismissed. Over time you will discover that they will no longer be even mentioned at all. So the next generation will never hear about them. Let us reference Igbo, country, nation and Gust of Us versus interesting narrative by Bird A and it was published in 2006. Now we see how they will leverage on the lies of the past to shape the future so you understand their game. So it, the author begins by telling us that once again the natural origins of Gustavus Vasa, the African, are a matter for debate. In the early 1790s, short pieces in two British papers questioned whether the author of the interesting narrative of Olo de Quiano was indeed, as he claimed in his memo, a native of Africa. The articles in question, unburdened by evidence, asserted that Vasa had been born in the Danish West Indies. Vasa considered the charge a scrolless one and quickly mobilized friends and allies to quash it. Now remember, this author has carefully avoided the fact that he wrote them through a lawyer and they apologized and said it wasn't or didn't originate from them. Note this very well. The editor of the most judicious and useful modern edition of the interesting narrative has raised similar questions concerning Vasa's birthplace. This time, however, the questions are based firmly in the documentary record, calling explicit attention to a too long neglected portion of Vasa's baptismal record and pointing to an uncovered ship monster, both of which list South Carolina as Vasa's birthplace. So you should begin to ask yourself, what is this? What are their interests in his birthplace? So Vincent Carreta has offered the following puzzle concerning the now canonical author. We must ask why, if he had indeed been born Olo de Quiano in Africa, he chose to suppress these facts. How could a slave have suppressed facts when they were not allowed to read? So you see how they bring in doubts that ordinarily wouldn't exist if somebody doesn't bring them. Here you must note that Alexander X. Bird is an assistant professor of history at Rice University. So you have to bear this in mind. This is a professor writing. Let us also reference Equiano, the African biography of a self-made man by Vincent Carreta and it was published in 2005. There we see the following. That recent biographical discoveries have cast doubt on Equiano's story of his birth and early years. The available evidence suggests that the author of the interesting narrative may have invented rather than reclaimed an African identity. If so, Equiano's literary achievements have been vastly underestimated. Batismo and Nava records say that he was born in South Carolina around 1747. If they are accurate, he invented his African childhood and his much quoted account of the middle passage on a slave ship. Other newly found evidence proves that Equiano first came to England years earlier than he says. He was clearly willing to manipulate at least some of the details of his life. Problematic as such evidence may be, any would be biographer must now take it into account. So you see how subtle the slave master is. So you see how this person writing in 2006 picked up from nowhere and forgot that when Equiano was physically alive and well, he did write the editors through a lawyer, of which if there was any fact around it, they would have all come up with it at that time. So you see the challenge. Whereas the so-called Negro professors are all sleeping. In fact, the forward on this book was written by Professor Gates. So you see he probably doesn't pay attention to details or simply runs with the crowd. So he, he didn't see what this guy is writing. So you see how something, an issue they raised, false accusation they brought up, has been blown up out of proportion. It's now never records by who they won't mention. So you see how they come up with their fraud all over the place. And from the journal we were looking at before we referenced this material, you see how they cross-referenced each other. All they are working to do is to make sure that his narrative is proven to be wrong. It doesn't matter how true it is. So this one goes on to say, 
questions concerning Vassar's place of birth are mostly pressing because they affect the light in which his interesting narrative is viewed and interpreted. Accordingly, Carreta has pointed out that from the available evidence, one could argue that the author of the interesting narrative invented an African identity rather than reclaimed one. If so, Carreta continues, Equiano's literary achievements have been underestimated. So you see how they come with fraud everywhere. So further down he says, Vasa, a close study of his narrative makes clear, wrote about Igbo, his 18th century spelling. But notice that Igbo was spelt that way at that time, but they are referring it, making it look like it was his own. And about his Igbo-ness in an ambiguous, undecisive and sometimes quite confused manner. But rather than indicating an unfamiliarity with being Igbo versus apparently incomplete grasp and enigmatic expression of his Igbo-ness actually suggests someone deeply familiar with and in some way affected by the social and political geography of the Biafra interior. Now, the, this author was writing in the 60s, so this is where they are now looking at what Equiano was saying and the war of 1967-70 to 70, where the Muslims, Christians and Jews connived to unleash terror on the Negroes of Biafra at that time. So you understand what games they are playing. This is deeper than what you're saying. So you see how someone else born more centuries later has picked on the book and is looking for places to debunk it from. Whereas at the time Equiano was alive, he wrote them through a lawyer and they denied knowing the source of the story. Now look at how the author contradicts what he previously wrote. He says, in the mid 19th century, the Reverend Sixmont Coel, who compiled a comparative vocabulary of African languages, paid particular attention to this point in his Polyglota Africana. Coele, who was based in the colony of Sierra Leone when Great Britain was actively engaged in the suppression of the Atlantic slave trade, interviewed African captives who had been emancipated at sea by British patrols and who were later landed at Freetown, the colonial capital of Sierra Leone. In the linguistic work based on his interviews, when Coel attended to what he referred to as the Igbo dialects of the Niger Delta languages, he began with a rather startling observation. Though it was customary that Africans who have come from the Bight are called Igbos, that's what everyone from the southern part of Nigeria today that are not Bini or Yoruba we are called, they were all Igbos. The Reverend ascertained through conversation with said Igbos that they never had had the name until their settlement as Sierra Leone. So that's, they are talking of the name Igbo. Instead, the philologist informant claimed a number of different affiliations. Among other things, they called themselves Isoma, Isoama, Mbofia, Isiele, and Aro. Further, even 70 years ago, colonial officers and anthropologists working in southeastern Nigeria sometimes encountered a similar conundrum when they too went looking for the Igbo. In the 1930s, a colonial anthropologist sent to assess the social and political structure of an Igbo subtribe reported back that his subjects declared that they are not Igbo and referred to all the other Igbo speaking peoples as Igbo. So now this is very interesting. You need to understand why they they are saying that. Now if you go further in the highlighted portion it says evidence from the Biafran interior concerning the ways the Igbo was used across the region suggests further why Vasa may have found the term problematic in the 20th century. Though there were few if any communities who styled themselves Igbo, the rather antagonistic eaters of Igbo prevailed as a name taken by age set organizations throughout the region. The existence of the title is important because it suggests that though there were few communities in the Biafran interior that used Igbo to describe themselves, there were numerous groups who applied the term to others. But our interest is the fact that Equiano used Igbo 
they are now trying to claim that the, the, the name did not exist as at the time of his writing. But then they forgot that the slave buyers, the slave merchants, labeled the whole place Igbo. Igbo is actually the name for all the slaves from the Bight of Benin and Biafra period. All Negro slaves from there were called Igbo. So what happened is they used terror to choose or divide the people along who is and who is not. And this is done by the slave masters foot soldiers which is so totally different from what we are looking at in this video. So if we go back to Aquinas book, we will see a letter, a response from the editors to his lawyers through which he wrote them when they wrote the lie. You see how the lie has multiplied. So he says, there sir, your note of the theater last month that is out, I would have answered in course but wished first to be able to inform you what paper we had taken the article from which respected Gustavus Vasa. By this day's post, have sent you a copy of the oracle of Wednesday the 25th. In the last column of the third page, you will find the article from which we inserted the one in the star of the 27th in last month. So if it be erroneous, you will see it had not its origin with us. You see how a people that started the whole nonsense are saying if it's erroneous, they can see that it didn't start with them. Now remember the reason they were able to run away from the legal actions is because Negroes at that time had no right technically to get judgment, which is the same thing you see today. You can see it in Nigeria as well. People may not know, but if you're a Negro and you go to court, the system is engineered to make sure that you don't win, whether you like it or not. If you doubt what we're saying, you can investigate the case of Biafra, IPOB, and the army. You will see that the army is a law unto itself. The court cannot try them. They are above the law because that was the slave raiding terror group. It was just renamed and given uniforms. So that's the same game playing out here. It says, as to GV, which is Gustavus Vasa, I know nothing about him. So now this is the same person that published that he wasn't born in Africa. Now he's saying this is where I saw it. Then he knows nothing about it. That's because the slave master understands propaganda and lies. Now you see how they are bringing it up centuries later to further discredit him. Now you see the burden of proof should have been on those that are claiming otherwise. While the guy made an attempt to correct any other doubts they may have, they had nothing to say. But you see, generations down the line, that's what they call unity of purpose. They understand lying more than anything. That's the slave masters. Now when you, a child goes to school, the only book in history written by supposedly a Negro at that time, all they have to say about it is how he lied. Whereas the guy did not lie and he made every effort to bring them at that time to say, where is your doubt? Let me clarify it. They didn't. So it goes further to say, after examining the paragraph in the oracle which immediately follows the one in question, I am inclined to believe, this is the people that published it or that are writing, that the one respecting GV, that's Gustavus Vasa, may have been fabricated by some of the advocates for continuing the slave trade for the purpose of weakening the force of the evidence brought against that trade for i believe if they could they would stifle the evidence altogether having sent you the oracle we have sent all that we can say about the business i am there sir your most humble servant alex tillock star office 5th may 1792 so this is a reply to equinox letter to them through a lawyer if you notice they wrote the lawyer that's the lawyer's office that they are writing to. So you see the thing. But these other people are not even mentioning the lawyers at all. They instead said he called his friends to debunk it. So you see how the game works. You have to pay very close attention to details. Read between the lines to understand and understudy the game of the slave master. They do it all the time. So here again we see that Equiano did his best to record, at least put the letters down in writing for posterity but unfortunately the negroes do not read so here it says letter from the reverend dr j baker of mayfair chapel london to mr gustavus vassa at david dale's esquire glasgow that those are his lawyers the david dale's esquire glasgow yes sir 
I went after Mr. Millen, the printer of the Oracle, but he was not at home. I understood that an apology would be made to you and I desired it might be a proper one such as would give fair satisfaction and take off any disadvantageous impressions which the paragraph alluded to may have made. That's the paragraph of saying he was not born in Africa. Whether the matter will bear an action or not, I do not know and have not inquired whether you can punish by law because I think it is not worthwhile to go to the expense of a lawsuit, especially if a, pro a proper apology is made. For can any man that reads your narrative believe that you are not a native of Africa? I see therefore no good reason for not printing a fifth edition on account of a scandalous paragraph in a newspaper. I remain there, sir, your sincere friend, J. Baker. Governor Street, May 14th, 1792. So now you see that Gustavus Vasa did his best to keep these records. But instead, the Negroes do not read it. They would rather read what the slave master is saying. If you notice the book that claimed that he was born in somewhere in the United States now was written by an American and the forward or whatever thing was written by Professor Gates at the back. He probably didn't read this. Even if he read it, he has to dance to the tune of his masters. Now you see why the education is very dangerous because it is not tuned to bring out the worth of the Negro. It's actually designed to denigrate him. Believe it or not, we are not against education, but the content of that education, if you were to check the curriculum of Nigerian schools today, you will probably understand what we're saying. We're going to show you one more little thing before we round up. So, we reference The Negro and the White Man by Bishop W.J. Gaines and it was uh, published in 1897 and there we see the following. The word Negro is of Latin origin derived from Niger, which means black. It is applied to the races of the African continent and to their descendants in the Old and New World. So, go and find out what Old and New Worlds are. The Egyptians, Barbers, Abyssinians, and Nubians of Northern Africa are not classed as the Negro, though there is a strong admixture of Negro blood in most of these. The term Negro is not a national appellation, but is applied generally to about one half of the population of Africa, including the most fertile portion of that continent. Professor Willis Burton of the Ohio University in an ably written article which appeared in the arena of September 1896 says, the black race has a history. In fact, all history is full of pieces of the black element. It is now usually recognized as the oldest race of which we have any knowledge. The wanderings of these people since prehistoric history began have not been confined to the African continent. In Paleolithic times, the black man roamed at will over all the fairest portions of the old world europe as well as asia and africa acknowledges or whatever but our interest is the fact that you see that the negro does not apply to all africans the idea of we are all africans is a slave master's game using his foot soldiers he tells them to keep saying oh no we are all africans and unfortunately they lack the most basic of common sense and if you doubt what we're saying imagine how you would feel Somebody is telling you that you are his brother and telling you how he murdered your parents and happy about it. So that somebody is so happy that he murdered your parents and all your siblings and perhaps you are the only one left. And he is telling you that oh yeah he did it in good faith and expecting you to understand that he murdered your parents for your own good. So that should tell you that these people lack the most basic of common sense. If you doubt what we're saying, all you need to do is to go to places like Nigeria today. Go to Southern Kaduna, go to the Middle Belt, go to Ambazonia, go to Biafra. And ask yourself, how can people who claim to be your brothers be taking weapons from the slave masters and murdering your own siblings in their numbers? And history and records show that they are not the same people. And the slave master leverages on that, hides behind them to perpetuate his evils. So we round up by looking at just one page from this book as well. So we see where it tells us that the ruling tribes are called Hamites. 
the sunburnt family according to Dr. Winchell of Negritic origin says Canon Rawlinson but back of these ruling Hamites were a light-headed people gay, good-natured, pleasant, supportive, witty, droll, amorous such are the descriptive terms used in telling the story of these primitive tribes who Dr. Taylor says lived peaceably in those regions for 2000 years before the advent of the Asiatic invaders. And here we come to the end of this edition of the Negro and Education Part 1. We thank you very much for listening and we do hope you will find time to conduct your own research or at least look for the materials referenced and study them yourself. Thank you very much once again for listening. Peace.